Hey everyone, Mike from vSwitch Zero. So in front of me, I've got the 82430i socket seven board from a company called Full Yes. And yeah, that's definitely one of the cooler sounding company names in the history of motherboards, I think. So this board might look a little bit familiar and that's because I used it in the recent socket to me seven build off that, uh, that I participated in. And I won't get into too much detail about this board because I went over it in a lot of detail in that video. Um, but I will put a link to it in the description if you'd like to learn more about it. But uh, I'll, I'll give you just a quick overview here. So this is a very early Socket 7 board, and it looks a lot more like a late 46 or even an early Socket 5 board than what you'd expect to see in a Socket 7 system. And really that's because it really is one of the very first Socket 7 platforms. It's based on Intel's older but very capable 430FX chipset. So a few things you'll probably notice right away um, that sort of set this apart are the uh, VRM socket right here, which was for split plane voltage for the future MMX processors. And uh, remember, this thing came out long before MMX was even a thing, so they were sort of planning ahead there. Um, it's even got like tantalum capacitors, which you saw mainly on older boards too. And of course, it's got a lot more ISA slots than PCI slots, which is also sort of a sign of the times there. But more than anything, um, you'll notice that it doesn't use the familiar square-shaped pipeline burst cache chips. It uses older asynchronous SRAM uh, chips that go up here. And you see these uh, a lot more on 46 and even some 30, 386 boards, um, possibly even older ones. So definitely not something you'd typically see on a Pentium board. So another interesting thing about the board is that the design of it was done in such a way that you can actually have either type of memory. You could have pipeline burst cache or SRAM. And you can see that the solder pads for pipeline burst cache actually do exist up here, um, which is kind of neat. There's also a spot for a jumper bank. I think it's labeled as JP1 and 2 up here. There's no jumpers. There's just the little bridge wires that sort of uh, short two pads there. And this was actually, if you refer to the manual, intended to select between the two types of cache. So this was really sort of a dual purpose board. I'm guessing that they uh, basically just had two different configurations available. I'm assuming the pipeline burst option was more expensive and probably the SRAM option was the, uh, the cheaper of the two. So as you can probably imagine, I had been very tempted to actually take some pipeline burst uh, cache and, and solder it over here. I have a dead Pentium board that would be a perfect donor for this purpose. Um, but really the only thing sort of holding me back right now is that my soldering skills are probably not quite up to the task of doing something like that yet. I am getting better and uh, hopefully one day I'll be able to do something like that. Um, so I'll save that for a project for another day. But really all you'd have to do is solder the cache on and put a proper jumper bank here and you could actually switch between the two and, and do some comparisons. But for today, I'm not here to talk about pipeline burst cache. I'm here to talk about SRAM. And as you can see, there's actually none in this board whatsoever. So all eight sockets are empty, including the tag socket that's over here. So I actually did some musical chairs with uh, cache in my systems recently. So this board actually had 256K of UMC 15 nanosecond stuff that was actually pretty good quality. And uh, I basically took it out and put it into my 486 uh, system that I'm building for my daily uh, gaming rig. And uh, if you wanna learn more about that system, there'll be a link in the description to that video as well. But uh, obviously I can't leave this empty, so I've got to put something in here. And I didn't want to just replace it with the same sort of stuff that was in there already. I wanted to do an upgrade while I was at it. So one thing I noticed right away when I got this board was that the SRAM sockets are actually larger uh, than the SRAM chips that were installed. So these are actually 32 pin uh, sockets for higher density cache uh, ICs. The ones that were in there were the common 28 pin types. And so that must mean that this board can support more than 256K. So the, uh, af and indeed after consulting the manual, I could see 512K was supported, but uh, not using 28 pin chips, you needed the 32 pin 64K times eight chips. So let's talk SRAM capacities here for a minute. So I've got two different SRAM chips in front of me here. One's larger than the other, as you can see here. So the one in the back is a 32 pin chip and the one in the front is the much more common 28 pin that you see on most boards, especially 486s, this is really what you see. Now the 28 pin uh, chips, you will find that the maximum size for these is 32K. 
And uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe the reason for that has to do with the number of pins that are available here. There's just a limitation with the addressing that can be done with this with that number of pins. So anything larger than 32K, you have to go with a 32 pin variety. Now, as I mentioned, a lot of boards don't have 32 pin uh, sockets. So in that case, you are limited to 32K. Uh, per chip and with most most boards supporting no more than uh, eight sockets that sort of limits you to 256k and that's why you saw so many old boards with that 256k cash limit now these uh, 32 pin uh, modules have been around for a very long time they just weren't very common or popular um, you actually saw these used quite a bit in later 486 boards not so much to provide more cash in, to the system but to provide the ability to use the same amount of cache in less space. So that you'd find that a lot of those boards would actually only have four sockets instead of eight, and that they would use these 64K chips as opposed to the 32s just to save board real estate. So it was useful for that. Um, these 32 pin chips come in two sizes generally that you can find. So this one here is a 64K times eight, but there is also a 128K times eight. And if you have eight sockets on your board, you could in theory go as high as uh, one megabyte of cache. And I actually have a um, special 486 board called the Magnum Cache, which is a pretty cool name. And uh, that one is actually a really old board made back in 1991. And that one actually does support eight 128K chips for a total of one meg of cache, which was pretty unheard of back then. So pretty cool. Another interesting thing I noticed is even though the manual is very specific about supporting only 512K of cache, if you look in the little gaps of the sockets here, there's some silk screening on the board that says 128K times eight. Now I know you can't always trust silk screening. That might actually just be there to describe the physical characteristics of it being a you know 32 pin socket that needs to go there, but uh, interesting nonetheless. I did also want to point out, so there's, you can see that there is a ninth socket here. So these eight here are for your actual cache capacity, and that's really where your cache data is stored. But this ninth socket here is what's called a tag cache or tag RAM uh, socket. And it uses the same similar type of SRAM uh, memory that has to go here, but it doesn't actually contribute to your total amount of, of cache that you have in your system. So it works very similar to like the file allocation table on a file system that sort of tells you where blocks are, are located. And you need some capacity here uh, in order to do that with your cached memory blocks. So areas in main, me main memory that are stored in cache need to be sort of tracked somehow. And rather than reserving or wasting some of your actual cache for that, there's a special uh, tag cache uh, IC that's gonna be used for that purpose. Now there's a couple of requirements for tag cache. I mean, it does have to be the same speed as your actual cache memory, and but it does not necessarily have to be the same size. And there's a few different things that sort of determine how large your, your tag needs to be. Uh, I believe the total amount of cached memory that the board supports is one uh, thing to consider, um, but there's also uh, how much cache memory you have. So those two things sort of dictate how much you'll actually need. Now in my case here, it's only a 28 pin uh, socket for the tag. So that sort of limits you as far as how much cash can actually be supported in the board. Now I'm not sure exactly uh, how much would be needed or how much cacheable memory is supported by this. I think it might be 64 megs of total cacheable memory. Um, but at any, at, at any rate, the largest uh, tag that can go in here because of the socket limitations is 32k. So I'm not sure if that's why uh, one megabyte uh, total cache isn't supported on this board, but I suspect it might have something to do with that. All right, so we'll get this cache installed in just a moment here, but I did uh, want to just show you what I'm going to be using. So um, this is the same one I showed uh, earlier, the UMC uh, 64K times 8. It's uh, rated for 15 nanoseconds, and UMC is a brand that I, I like and trust, um, so I, I was happy to pick these ones up. They were really cheap on eBay, um, but I do want to just uh, give everyone a friendly warning that there are, uh, you know, some... Uh, SRAM chips out there on eBay especially um, that are either relabeled or just plain fake. So you do have to be very careful when you purchase these. Um, you definitely want to look around, especially where the text is. Make sure that the font doesn't look a little funny and the logo looks correct. 
You can also sometimes uh, see in close-up pictures if if the uh, the IC looks disturbed at all, like something's been sort of sanded or scratched off around there. So just be careful when you purchase them. Um, there are a lot of sellers trying to get rid of new old stock of these kinds of things because they are, you know, not very popular anymore. So you can't really go on price. You know, there are cheap ones out there. It doesn't necessarily mean they're fake if they're cheap. But uh, but yeah, just just be careful. Do your best to to avoid anything that looks a little sketchy. But uh, yeah, these ones should work great. I did uh, buy uh, three packs of three. That's just how they sold them. Uh, gave me one extra one that I don't really need. But hey, it's always good to have a spare in case one goes bad or you never know. Um, I did also want to show you the, the tag chip that I'm going to use here. So this one is a little bit different. It's an ISSI chip, but it's also rated for 15 nanoseconds. So it should be, should be fine. This one's 32K and I just uh, had it spare when I removed some cash from an older board. So this should work perfectly as well. So installing the chips is quite straightforward. The only thing you really need to look out for is the notch that's on each of the chips. You do need to match that with the notch that's in the uh, socket. It will allow you to put them in backwards, so be very careful with that. You'll also find too that if you do get new stock or new old stock of uh, these chips, that sometimes the legs are bent outwards a little bit. So sometimes you have to uh, bend them back in the opposite direction just a little bit on a flat surface like a table, and that'll let them go into the sockets a lot easier. So once all the cash is installed, the only thing that's left to do is to set the jumpers on the board. So boards of this era, they really didn't auto detect cash or anything like that. So you had to tell it how much cash was there using jumpers. Uh, based on the manual, it's JP20 and 21 that need to be modified as well as JP3. So once those are set, we will get this board powered up and see how it works. So just before I get the uh, system powered up with the new cash memory installed, I'm not sure if you noticed, but I had this uh, Trident card in the system earlier in the video. I uh, just wanted to give a quick shout out to Gordos Legacy Lair from Twitter. Uh, he tweeted recently that he got a bunch of PCI video cards from a friend, and uh, I mentioned that I had uh, sort of a soft spot for Trident cards, and he very kindly offered to send this over to me. So thanks so much, and uh, it's been working great. I've been using it, uh, doing some bench testing, and hopefully I'll find some other purposes for it later on. Uh, you know, being a, a new YouTuber, um, it's quite exciting to actually get sort of my first unofficial uh, channel donation, so to speak. So thank you again for, uh, for sending this over. Really appreciate it. All right, so the system posted without issue, so that's great. And I'm just going to be looking at the summary page coming up here to make sure there's 512k reported. And yep, top right hand corner, 512k of cache memory. And the type is reported as async, which is correct. So I'm just going to uh, launch Phil's benchmark pack here, and I'm going to run a tool called Cache Check. Um, so it's a useful tool to uh, see if your various cache levels are working as you expect. So it basically reads and writes data of varying block sizes and reports back the access time and uh, gives you some throughput uh, scores at the end. So we can see here that everything from 0 to 8K, so that's the L1 cache on the CPU, is doing about 10 or 11 nanoseconds. And everything above 8K all the way up until 512K here is showing up as 17 nanoseconds. So that's excellent. So that's telling me that all 512K of the L2 cache is being used. Everything above that is registering as about 24 nanoseconds. So that's that's your main memory access time. And uh, the overall score for L2 cache is 64 and a half megabytes per second and 16.3 nanoseconds. Unfortunately, I didn't get before and after uh, values when I upgraded. It would have been neat to check that. Maybe in the future I'll do that. So really the only thing left to do is just to use the system for a while and make sure that it's stable. Um, I'm just going to run some loops of the uh, Doom benchmark for a while, just make sure that uh, the system doesn't crash out or anything. But so far, so good. I think we can call this a success. So that's it for today. Thanks very much for watching. I was really happy to finally get some cash back into this system here. And uh, hopefully we'll see this board again as I use it in some other projects. And as always, please don't forget to like and subscribe if you'd like to see some more retro content like this. Thanks again.